hope it's not too dark for uh, you to see me, but um, all right, you know what, I'll just, I'll just do it like this. All right, um, so I was going to do a Lovecraftian Let's Read tonight, because, you know, it's been a while since we did one of those, I kind of got a hankering for it, but I found something even better. Um, when I went to go to the website, uh, I had Google Photos open in a tab, and I saw pictures that I took of, um, because I, I recently, it, well, okay, don't worry about, don't worry about how I, how I got this, but the important thing is some preface. So before we just get right into the main event, what I'm about to read is a story that I wrote, uh, when I was either, I think it was 11 years old. I think it, I think it was eleven, um, for uh, for school. I did FLVS, which is Florida Virtual School, so it was an online um, homeschool uh, program. And this stuff never really got you know looked at. They they just had like a like a vague grading rubric that they just like skim through it and be like, uh huh, yeah, it looks good, hundred percent. So. You know, because a lot of the stuff I submitted on there, like, there's no way that if they actually, like, read it thoroughly, you know, I mean, I I really pushed the boundaries. A lot of that stuff was not <laughs> G-rated, um, you know, that I that I did for all that. Um, but uh, but this story, you know, it's, rel it's relatively PG. It's, you know, but, um, yeah, um. I, so the assignment was I was supposed to write a narrative, and it I didn't have to make it this long. I made it like really long. I think it's like sixteen pages or something. Uh, you only had to do like you know two or three pages, um, and you were actually supposed to. They actually set up like a uh, a uh, what is it exposition uh, for you to work with, and they gave you like characters and you know a setting and all of this. And um, I had no interest in it. It bored me. So I just um, <laughs> I just was like, all right, you know what? Just immediately, like straight out the gate, like first paragraph, I'm just going to kill off all these characters and we're going to do away with this. And we're, we're going to do my thing. So it's going to be a completely separate story. And um, so that's basically what I did. But I, I ended up keeping uh, the protagonist for a little while. Uh, you'll see. Um, but the main thing that you need to know, because uh, when I start this, it's going to feel like it's in the middle of something. So the main thing you need to know is that the character of Kate was the protagonist for the story, that the, the exposition that they gave me. And for some reason, I decided to not just kill her right away. Oh, Mr. Jax is another one, because I'm just looking at the, the beginning here. Uh, Mr. Jax was, I, I forget what the story was. It was something boring, something with like, force fields or whatever, so there's something about magnets or something, but, uh, so it was Kate and Mr. Jax were two of the main characters, and, uh, the last line of the exposition is the first line, um, of what I'm about to read, and that's it, so it just, like, picks up immediately where that left off. I don't have that, because that was part of FLVS, and I'm not, or I can't access that anymore, since I'm, you know, not a high school student, but, um, you know, or I guess I would have been middle school or whatever, but, yeah, yeah, I mean, college, you know, you know what I mean, um, but, um, yeah, it's been four minutes now, so I think it's time to just get into it, but, um, yeah, so it just picks up right where that left off, and, uh, yeah, it's a wild ride, I must warn you, since I was, you know, a kid when I wrote this, a lot of it's kind of far-fetched, so, you know, I'm just giving, like, a little, uh, eye-rolling warning here to, uh, ex you know, expect that. But uh, cut me some slack here. Uh, hopefully, if you're at least a little entertained like I am, because I know a lot of you have been asking for, you know, relics from my childhood and, like, projects I made and things I did and stuff. Uh, we're still working on the Joshua News. That that might happen at some point, but that's kind of on the back burner right now. Um, but this is, this is, like, up there with the Joshua News. It wasn't quite as young, because the Joshua News, I was, like, six, seven years old. So that was, like, you know, that's even even better. Um, but yeah, this, you know, I don't know, let me, it's five minutes now, let me just get into it. Joshua's a narrative story, untitled. 
And just where do you think you're going? Asked a deep voice, followed by a small bark. Well, it's only really a deep voice. There you go, let me go again. And just where do you think you're going? Asked a deep voice, followed by a small bark. It was Mr. Jacks. You're alive, Kate said in shock. Well, of course I am, Mr. Jack said with a fake laugh and a rather puzzled expression. Kate was now realizing that she had only just dreamt that he had died of mysterious causes. Wow, huh, Kate said in disbelief. Are you okay, Mr. Jacks asked. Yeah, I, I think so, Kate replied. There was silence for a moment. Oh, hey, there's something I want to show you, Kate said, suddenly excited. Uh, sure, but can, can you make it quick? I have to get home to my wife and children, Mr. Jax asked. Don't worry, it'll be fine. You're gonna love it. Come with me, Kate said, even more excited. Mr. Jax grew more and more confused and worried as they got nearer to the border between fields, for he did not know about the force field even existing. Um, where are we going? Mr. Jax asked with worry and fear in his voice. Don't tell me we're headed to that weird-looking thing up ahead. If you're referring to if you're referring to the force field border to the if you're referring to the force field border, oh, I already got that right. Okay. If you're referring to the force field border, then yes, Kate replied. Oh, heck no! I ain't doing that crap, Mr. Jack said. And I'm not altering the words here. This is literally verbatim what I wrote. You know, I was 11 years old. Ah, oh, come on, it'll be fun, Kate answered, smiling. Oh, crap. Okay. Uh, oh, come on, it'll be fun, Kate answered, smiling. Well, all right, I guess. As long as you're sure it's safe, Mr. Jack said. That's the spirit, Kate said. Just then they reached the border. Kate attempted to retrieve her mirror from Mr. Jax's rabid dog, Frobbles, but it just bit her before ripping its own tail off and slowly bleeding to death. Mr. Jax smiled and petted it. She used her hands instead. This was harder, but she could still do it. Copy your eyes, Mr. Jax, she said. Or said Kate. They reached the hole that Kate had come through. Follow me, said Kate, taking one final glance at Mr. Jax. She climbed out. She waited for Mr. Jax to follow. After waiting a while, she got frustrated and decided to go back and check on him. As soon as she set foot back into the force field, the first thing she saw was Mr. Jax's body soaking in a puddle of blood. He had massive burn marks and even holes in his skin revealing his insides with fresh blood gushing out. He lied there motionless as he was already dead. Kate laughed and stomped on his dead corpse repeatedly, as this is precisely the way he had looked in her dream. Suddenly, Kate started to feel lightheaded and dizzy. Everything around her began spinning faster and faster until she awoke in a strange and unfamiliar atmosphere. She tried to move, but couldn't. She then realized that she was strapped into a chair-like object. It was completely dark and completely silent. Suddenly, she heard what sounded like footsteps. The footsteps grew closer and closer, and then they stopped, just inches away from the chair that Kate was strapped into. An unsettling voice then announced, I am the wizard of life. At this point, Kate was very scared and fearful. Suddenly, a light, a light from an unknown source mysteriously turned on and illuminated the whole room. It revealed a tall old man with a big long white beard covering his mouth, wearing a hat and robe with symbols and designs in a foreign language. She watched as the man slowly approached the chair and little by little started to free her of all the restraints. There, that's better, the same voice said. The man began to walk away. Kate tried to get up, but she still couldn't. Uh, excuse me, sir, said Kate. The man stopped walking. Yes, he replied. How do I get up, she asked. The man began to walk away again. Jump, he said, on his way out. The light began to dim as the man disappeared into the darkness. Kate tried jumping off the chair, but it didn't work. She finally built up the strength to try a final time, and she jumped as high as she could. She heard a snapping noise before finally breaking free of the chair. She tumbled onto the floor. She looked back at the chair seconds later to see a robotic body sitting in it. Could that have been what she had jumped out of? It then occurred to her that when she fell, she had no pain. She then realized that she could not see her arms or legs or any part of her body for that matter. Suddenly, the floor began to crack underneath her, sending her falling down thousands and thousands of feet. Again, she felt nothing. After falling for quite some time, she eventually crashed through the roof of a building and landed on the floor. She got up, feeling no pain, and began to look around. It was very hot in the room. The walls were all gray as well as the floor. 
she had discovered a lone mirror in the midst of nothing. She looked in it, but did not see the reflection. She began panicking, running as fast as she could through the seemingly endless hallway of nothing, calling desperately to anyone around. After running for what felt like an eternity, she found a door. She opened it. It was what looked like some kind of weird house. Kate found herself staring at the creepy paintings on the wall. Most of them were of extremely dark events that have occurred throughout human and vinegarial history, most of which were often looked over. They had the dates written on them of when these events took place. However, there was one particular painting that stood out to her. It appeared to be of her crying and holding a blood-covered, decayed corpse. A chill went down her spine when she noticed that the date on it was the present date. Before she was able to get a closer examination, however, an angry-sounding voice called, What are you doing here? Kate looked over at the direction the voice was coming from. Before she got a chance to react to what she saw, the voice spoke again. Oh, you're one of the Wizard of Life's victims. Experiments, yeah, right. She looked up to see she looked up to see a big court like setting with a podium and lots of chairs. There was a giant furnace with what appeared to be a dead alien cooking in it, as well as various other massive terror inducing weapons of proportions never before heard of. There was also a big see through wall. Behind it were two floating faces. The first, which appeared to be the one speaking, and obviously the one in charge, was made up completely of ice and had a very irritated expression. The second whoops uh The second, whom appeared to be resting at the moment, was made up completely of fire and had a demonic grin on its face. They appeared to be plugged into something. The only possible clue was a nearby computer which has wires plugged into it which looked similar, if not identical, to the wires plugged into the faces. Who are you? Kate asked nervously. That's not important. What is important is what, we d is what I do, the icy face replied. And what's that? Kate asked, slowly building up her confidence. Balancing the universe, the icy face replied, losing his anger. Okay, uh, can you tell me why I'm here? Please, asked Kate. Come on. Is this it? To the next page. Okay. Can you tell me why I'm here, please, asked Kate. Actually, I was just about to ask you the same question, the icy face replied. However, there is someone I know that just might be able to clear all up. Just then, the door began to creak open. And there it is now, the icy face exclaimed. The same old man from earlier entered, slowly as before. Son, would you mind explaining all of this? The icy face shouted, regaining his anger. The man, completely ignoring the face, turned to Kate and said, Ah, oh, Kate, I was hoping you'd be here. He suddenly turned to the icy face and said, I believe I'll be leaving now. Come on, Kate. Can you at least tell me what this is all about? The icy face snapped. The man began to walk away, pulling Kate with him. On their way out, the man mumbled back to the icy face, Experiments. What was all of that? asked Kate. Well, you see, the two floating faces back there were my fathers, the Wizard of Life said. Fathers? said Kate. It's a long story. Look, there's a reason that you're here, said the Wizard of Life. And why is that? asked Kate. It is now your job to keep the balance of the universe in check, the Wizard of Life said. Okay, this is a lot for me to take in. First of all, am I dead? asked Kate. Well, technically, yes. Your spirit has exited your physical form to depart on a journey with me, the Wizard of Life said. We didn't want to have to do it, but it was an emergency, he added. Who is we? asked Kate. There are many other mortals here, the Wizard of Life replied. Like who? Kate asked curiously. That is none of your concern, the Wizard of Life replied, aggravated, cutting Kate off. Oh, uh, I, I, wait, what? Oh, okay. Oh, I see. Well, uh, how did I die? Asked Kate. Oh, I struck you with one of my lightning bolts, the Wizard of Life said. The last thing I remember before coming here is seeing Mr. Jax's dead body. How did he die? Asked Kate. He didn't cover his eyes, the Wizard of Life said. You may be able to get away with it, but outsiders must use the mirror. A pity. Frobles has never been this disobedient, not when I had him. <laughs> so he died trying to lead the force field, Kate asked. Yes, he replied. Your lifelong dream of murdering that worthless piece of crap had finally come true. <coughs> Is he here too then, she asked. No, we didn't need him. So he went to the other side of the universe 
To live as another being with no conscious memory of ever being a human, the Wizard of Life explained. Okay, uh, next question. Why was I strapped to a chair when I got here, Kate asked. That's where everyone appears, the Wizard of Life said. What is that supposed to mean, Kate asked. Well, you see, when you arrived, we had to make sure that your spirit got transferred directly from your human body to a robotic one to lessen the impact of the transformation. Then, after your spirit is stabilized, it can be released from that body to become a bodiless spirit being, the Wizard of Life explained. Oh, so that explains the robotic body sitting in the chair when I got off of it. But why couldn't I get up even after you wanted the restraints, asked Kate. Because you needed to stay in that body until it was time to be released, the Wizard of Life said. Okay, next question. How come I can feel fear, but I can't feel pain, asked Kate. The Wizard of Life laughed. Ah, uh -huh, humans, humans, humans. I keep forgetting how primitive your planet is. You see, I used to be a human like you, but the... Well, huh. Wow, I, I, I can't seem to remember much about that. Uh, I guess I've just been here so long that this place has become all that's relevant to me. He began to tear up as he stared at a tattoo on his arm of what appeared to be a black-and-white image of him in human form. Uh, but anyway, in response to your question, physical pain only comes with a physical body. Fear is an emotion. You do not need a body to feel emotion, explained the Wizard of Life. Okay, next question. Uh, where is this place? Kate asked. My realm, where my fathers and I live. I built this place. It's called the Realm of the Wizard of Life. And it's my station, he said. What exactly do you mean by station, Kate asked. Well, you see, I single-handedly created the universe you used to live in. I created the computer you saw in the other room to keep everything running on a consistent program. My fathers are in charge of balancing the forces of good and evil in the universe. I am neutral since I am a byproduct of a combination of the two. My job consists primarily of overseeing the destiny of the universe and fixing small problems along the way since the computer can only do so much. These things include beaming down to any specific planet and helping the life forms so that the species may prosper, such as what I'm currently doing with your planet, he said. And I have so much more in store for you. And what is that? Kate asked. You are about to find out, said the Wizard of Life, smiling. Here we are, he said, excited. They had reached another room, which looked like a storage unit. There were doors, each marked with different letters and symbols in various languages. As they kept heading down, there was a door, which appeared to be where the room ended. It was marked with only one word, the, the only one in English, human. The Wizard of Life opened the door and turned on a light, then began to leave and lock the door, leaving Kate inside the room. Well, where are you going? Kate asked, worried and confused. You can take it from here, the Wizard of Life said as he walked away. What am I supposed to do? Kate shouted loud enough for the Wizard of Life to hear. He stopped, turned around, and said, Awaken him to free yourself, and then disappeared into the darkness. Awaken who? Kate shouted as loud as she could, but it was too late, for he was already gone. The room suddenly felt very cold. She was trapped in there. She sat down and began to attempt to process everything that had happened to her. After doing so for a few minutes, she began to walk around. It was a very small room, mostly empty, except for a big sheet. She was puzzled by this and decided to take it off. She was shocked with mixed emotions as she uncovered a see-through tube with what looked like a dead human body in it. Surrounding it was only thin like wires and, and tubes. Or, wait, wait. Only, only thin, only thin wire-like tubes that led into a big, tall container. She didn't know what to think. She lied down on the floor and broke into tears. Suddenly, the Wizard of Life's words occurred to her. Could that be who she's supposed to awaken? Kate was willing to try anything to be free at this point. She unplugged the small tubes. Its eyes opened. Kate rushed over to see what was happening. It was the body of a male human, looking very pale, as if he had never seen sunlight in his life. He then began banging on the glass, asking to be let out. She didn't know how to perform such a task, until she spotted a plug at the bottom of the tube. She decided to unplug it. Immediately after doing so, the glass opened, allowing him to move freely. He got up and stood right in front of her. He began to speak. Hello, my name is Comrise, but you can call me Frozen Heat. That's what everyone back on Earth used to call me, he said. Frozen Heat had a very soothing voice. He reached out to shake Kate's hand. What do you mean, used to, she asked, as, he, as she shook his hand. Well, you see, I haven't been human for over a thousand years, he said. He began to chuckle. The chuckle soon turned into an evil laugh. His face then turned satanic. 
and his whole body burst into flames. In his eyes, Kate saw what, what looked like a swirling vortex of souls. She then heard the intolerable sound of chanting and squealing from Mr. Jax. She then awoke abruptly. Could that have all have been a dream? And if it was, how long was she dreaming for? Should she believe anything she saw? Just then she hit her head on something. One thing was for sure. She was back in her old body. She felt the unfamiliar feeling of pain as she hit her head, and her heart was beating faster than it had ever been in her entire life. She was covered in sweat, her face was red, and she had mysterious scars and bruises all over her body. She then discovered that what she had hit her head on was the same tube that she had dreamt about. She was imprisoned in it. There were electrodes hooked up to her head as if monitoring her. Suddenly, she heard muffled talking in the distance, followed by footsteps from outside the room getting closer. Her heart was pounding as she heard the door slowly creak open. The footsteps entered the room and continued until they reached the tube. They stopped. The light was then turned on. It revealed the Wizard of Life standing right there. He pushed a button and the door opened. He then came over to Kate and slowly unhooked all of the electrodes from her and unattached wires and tubes that she didn't even know were there. You're real? Kate exclaimed. Of course I am. It all is. Go out there and see for yourself, he said. I'm confused. First of all, what does awaken him to free yourself mean? She asked. You've already done that. That's why you woke up, he replied as he released her into the room. Oh yeah, and there's someone waiting for you outside, he added. Well, I have to get going now. I'm a very busy man. But wait, I have so many more questions for you, she pleaded. But it was too late. He was already gone. Kate opened the door to find the same man that she had awakened. Hello, my name is Comrise, but you can call me Frozen Heat, Kate interrupted. How did you know, he asked. Well, that's what everyone back on Earth used to call you, right, she said. Right. Well, it's nice to meet you, he said in the same soothing voice that she had remembered. They shook hands. Thank you for taking my place and allowing me to be free, Frozen Heat said. Not a problem, Kate said. Suddenly, the Wizard of Life appeared. Frozen Heat, why are you still here? He shouted. Oh, uh, right, uh, sorry, boss, Frozen Heat said. Boss, Kate said in confusion. Look, I, I don't have time to explain. I'm already late, he said. Late for what? Kate asked. To save the Earth, he said. Uh, can I come with you? She asked. Not this time, he replied. He then went into the transporter. He then went into a transporter beam. The Wizard of Life took Kate away into another room. Kate became violently aggressive toward the Wizard of Life, pushing and kicking him. Why are you taking me? Unhand me this instant! I demand to be with Frozen Heat, she began frantically shouting. The Wizard of Life calmly pulled out his needle and injected her with a shot. She instantly fell unconscious. He then pulled out his Ouija board from his pocket, ripped it into pieces, and then forcefully shoved it down the one and only hole in her new body while excitedly muttering, Ooh, we're gonna have some fun tonight. <laughs> <coughs> Meanwhile, Frozen Heat arrived on Earth. Since he was only a, since, uh, since he was asleep for a thousand years, it was the year 3000 AD. Since he was gone for so long, he had no idea what to expect. The transporter beam teleported him to Earth. Where on the planet was now irrelevant, or it all looked the same. Fire and lava pits everywhere, mutated humans attempting to survive in small underground shelters, and robotic soldiers fighting against equipped machines which were sent by the evil King Arnold, who now rules over the land. All cities, forests, fields, mountains, and water bodies had been destroyed long ago by the vicious wars that had erupted throughout the years. Frozen Heat soon spotted a hidden entrance to one of the underground shelters. Frozen Heat's eyes lit up as he anticipated speaking to the people of this now terrible, violent planet. He went in. He was greeted by one of the mutants shooting an old-fashioned gun at him with intentions of killing him. P please stop! There's no need to be frightened! I'm a human like you! cried Frozen Heat in fear of his life. The mutant stopped shooting, for he felt there was no threat in Frozen Heat. He, like all of the mutants, had green skin, was only two feet tall, and was bald. But Frozen Heat still recognized him as his old pal Marvin. Uh, Marvin? Frozen Heat said, thinking he was long dead by now. A frozen heat, Marvin said. Oh, what happened to you, Frozen Heat said. I'll tell you over lunch. Let's go to the one and only underground mutant diner, said Martin. So they went. There, Marvin explained how, soon after Frozen Heat had died, a deadly illness struck the majority of the world, and everyone infected was too weak to do most anything, including fighting. He explained how one citizen named Arnold was one of the only ones not infected, and so he took it... <laughs> what timing? The timing to, to, to read this. 
And so he took advantage of the worldwide crisis and ran for president of the United States of America and told its citizens that he came up with the cure to the illness and that anyone who voted for him would get it. So most of the people voted for him, and therefore most of the people got the antidote. As they later found out, though, it came at a very high price, and anyone who drank it would become mutated into the creatures that lived underground. The only people that didn't have the antidote were the ones that didn't support him. They were sentenced to slavery for their new leader. <coughs> Congress tried to prevent that, but Arnold just killed anyone that stood in his way. He passed countless laws taking away all of the people's rights, and eventually bribed the whole world with the antidote. This gave him full power and control over the whole world, and eventually he demanded to be worshipped as King Arnold. He also created an immortality pill, <laughs> which he only used for himself and his servants. The mutants managed to steal that, though, which prompted the current war. Marvin went on to say how they spanage... Marvin went on to say how they spend most of their time building robots, which they create to be soldiers to fight the powerful armed machine sent by King Arnold. Just then, a bomb was dropped by one of King Arnold's machines on the surface, causing the shelter to explode, killing everyone inside, and covering frozen feet and Marvin in blood and human insides. They were now exposed. That no good son of a piece of... This is the last time I... I'll, I'll finish my story later, said Marvin. We gotta run. Where are we going, asked Frozen Heat. To destroy King Arnold once and for all, Marvin said. Are you insane? You're going to get yourself killed, said Frozen Heat. Yes, I am, Annie. Yes, I am, Marvin replied. Well, where are your weapons, asked Frozen Heat. Well, let me see here. I've got a pocket knife and some brass knuckles. And then, of course, there's a gun I tried to kill you with, said Marvin. Well, then you're lucky I bring my lucky sword around me with, uh, around with me at all times. And the rest is all my powers, Frozen Heat said. All right, lay low and don't get caught. We're almost at the border of his kingdom, Marvin said. Just then they smelled something burning. It was the laser from the top of King Arnold's castle burning the tree that they were hiding behind. They had been spotted. Marvin ran to another tree. Frozen Heat, get out of there now, Marvin shouted. They barely made it out in time. The laser was tracking them. Suddenly, it shot a beam directly at Marvin, knocking him unconscious. Marvin, Frozen Heat shouted, but it was too late. When he went to pick up Marvin to carry him the rest of the way, he noticed a big hole in the back of Marvin's head, showing his brain and fluids with lots of fresh blood pouring out. Frozen Heat panicked. He knew that Marvin would surely die if not given immediate treatment, and the only way to do so was to get to the magic potion of healing that King Arnold uses for himself. Hold on, buddy. I promise I'll pay you back for all the times you saved my life, Frozen Heat said, worried. He knew that the only way to acquire the potion was to slay the robotic beast that lay atop the roof of the castle before blood flow was cut off to Marvin's brain. At the gates to King Arnold's kingdom, there were countless trained snipers with explosive bullets waiting to mutilate and destroy a trespasser. Frozen he was so worried about his friend that he wasn't paying attention to where he was going. Suddenly, he heard 100 snipers going off simultaneously, so he ran for his life. He ducked under a nearby tree, which got lit by a flamethrower that one of the guards had. As he ran away from the fire, he noticed that his hair was on fire. Using his quick thinking skills, he used his super jumping power to avoid bullets landing in the one and only canal, which encircled the cash castle, uh, extinguishing the fire immediately. As he, as he swam, dragging Marvin, as well as the trail of blood that came with him, his headset rang. Hello, Frozen Heat said. The signal was mostly static, but he could hear the Wizard of Life's voice saying, Is Marvin, by any chance, injured? Actually, yes, he has a severe head wound that doesn't look very good, Frozen Heat said. Why? Because, the Wizard of Life said, his soul is now entering my realm. That's, that's where we would take the intermission, but all right, keep going. As he was speaking, the trained snipers positioned themselves in the perfect spot to shoot their high-tech bullets that explode on impact even in water aimed direct. <laughs> As he was speaking, the trained snipers positioned themselves in the perfect spot to shoot their high-tech bullets that explode on impact even in water <laughs> aimed directly on target. It was now a mad dash for his life. What? said Frozen Heat, trying to reply to the Wizard of Life while dodging the bullets and explosions. Do you mean he's dead? Frozen Heat asked in fear and concern while trying to save his own life and still move toward the roof. The last thing he heard was the Wizard of Life's voice saying, Please, get the potion. We don't have much time. 
before a bullet struck the headset, incinerating it on impact. Frozen, he was extremely panicked as there was now no way to communicate with anyone. He got out of the water and onto the ladder, which was the only way to get up to the roof. In addition to the snipers shooting from above, the ladder was also covered in electricity-conducting rods that were randomly shooting out bolts aimed at Frozen. He, if struck, he would fall to a certain depth. As he climbed, he activated his shock absorber power just in case he were to get struck. Uh, just in case he were to get struck, this was a very wise decision as he managed to to uh, dodge all of the bullets on the way up. However, he did get struck by several bolts of electricity from the conductor rods. He would use his flying power and avoid the ladder altogether, but his jetpack was temporarily on the automatic charge setting, which would end soon, forcing him to continue climbing. As he prepared to get off the ladder, a bullet came directly at him. He was lucky he was able to catch it in time. He caught it in his hand, and just before it exploded, he threw it back at the snipers ahead of him, killing most of them instantly. He got off of the ladder and onto the roof. He took the guns from two of the dead snipers and put one in each hand. He began shooting the explosive bullets at the remaining snipers, attempting to hold them off as he got closer to the laser tower where the beast lived. However... They too dodged the vast majority of the bullets and chased after Frozen Heat, angry that they still hadn't obliterated him yet. He got to the laser tower and began to climb. As he did, he began to have difficulty seeing. He stopped moving and fell unconscious from a mysterious reason, dropping Marvin in the process. He awoke in what appeared to be an instant. He was in the realm of the Wizard of Life. He came off the transporter being worried and confused. Why am I here? he asked with a hint of annoyance and concern in his voice. He looked for the Wizard of Life, but he was nowhere in sight. After dreaming about the place for 1,000 years straight, he knew where his best chance of finding him was. He went back out into the hallway, through the computer room, into the main hallway where Kate ran through, and eventually reached a hole in the ceiling that Kate had made when she first got there. By this time, his jetpack was ready for use once more, so he used his newly regained flying powers to get back up to the entrance station. Upon his arrival, he noticed that the door to the simulator room was open. This is precisely where Frozen Heat had thought the Wizard of Life would be. He hesitated to enter as he did not wish to disrupt anything. Just then, the Wizard of Life exited the room, panting yet smiling, wearing only his underwear. <laughs> okay. Oh, Frozen Heat, oh, I'm glad you're here, he said with a smile, as if everything was perfectly fine. Wait a minute, what was it? Was it for some... Oh, Frozen Heat. I'm glad, I'm so glad you're here. Okay, all right. He said with a smile, as if everything was perfectly fine. You know, you picked a very bad time to summon me. Whatever it is that you need from me must be really important to interrupt my mission and risk killing my earthly body, Frozen Heat said, not phased by the Wizard of Life's efforts. <laughs> what? Actually, it is really important, the Wizard of Life said, returning Frozen Heat's annoyance. Okay, then what is it? Frozen Heat asked, getting impatient. Come with me, the Wizard of Life said. The Wizard of Life showed Frozen Heat the chair where newcomers arriving. Inside the robotic body was what appeared to be Marvin's soul. He still had pieces of his human body left, which meant that he was still partially alive in human form. Since Marvin was assisting Frozen Heat in his mission, the Wizard of Life was trying as hard as he could to keep him in his human form, but he only had so much power and there were other things to be done. So slowly, his human body began to disappear, and it was estimated that in about five more minutes of Earth time, all ties to his human existence would be severed, and he would be locked in the eternal void until the end of time, since there was no other use for him. Why are you showing me all this? asked Frozen Heed, very scarred by what he had just witnessed. To give you the motivation necessary to slay the beast, get the potion, and save your best friend's life in five minutes or less, the Wizard of Life said. If that's not motivation, I don't know what is, Frozen Heat replied, eager to get the mission over with. Good. Now, take this headset with you, because I see you don't have the last one with you. Oh yeah, and as soon as you get back into your human body, make sure you start climbing right away after you pick up Marvin, because I have frozen Earth time for the duration of your visit here to benefit you. However, upon your arrival, time will unfreeze and you will be in mid-air and Marvin out of your grip, said the Wizard of Life. Thanks for the tip. Oh, hey, uh, where's Kate at? I, I want to say goodbye, if you know what I mean. That's really, no, literally, the if you know what I mean was literally part of the, st the story. I didn't tack that on. 
Thanks for the tip. Oh, hey, uh, where's Kate at? I, I want to say goodbye. I mean, uh, you know what I mean, asked President Heat. Yeah, in the simulator room, but uh, I, w I wouldn't bother her if I were you, replied the Wizard of Life, glancing back in the room, chuckling. Oh, yeah, and uh, one more thing. The only way to kill the beast is with the explosive bullets from the snipers, he added. All right, well, goodbye then, said President Heat as he left for Earth. The Wizard of Life went back into the simulator room, closing the door behind him. Now, where were we? He began, excited. <laughs> wow, this is not subtle at all. Meanwhile, Frozen Heat arrived back on Earth and picked up Marvin, then he instantly resumed climbing. He eventually got to the top and found the laser. He got into the control station and shot the operator, exploding his body into pieces all over the room. He then began shooting the lasers at the remaining snipers, killing all that were left except four. By this time, but, uh, but his time was running out. He then heard a rumbling noise coming from underneath the control station of the laser tower. It was the beast. The Wizard of Life's words then occurred to him. He tried to shoot it, but then realized that he was out of ammo. He tried to get back down to the roof to grab a gun from one of the snipers he had killed with the laser, but the beast wouldn't let him escape its grip. He then came up with a plan. He stood directly in front of the four snipers and dared them to shoot him. They did. Frozen Heat then pulled out his lucky reflective sword, which deflected the bullets off of it and directly into the robotic beast. After all four of the bullets exploded, the beast's robotic insides went everywhere, covering everyone in blood and robotic organs. Inside one of the robotic organs was the magic potion of healing. He had found it just in time. He quickly set Marvin down and gave him the potion. As soon as he did, he began to feel sharp pain all over his body. He instantly knew what it was. The shock absorber power that he had used on the ladder was wearing off, causing the electricity to take its toll. But while he was in his 1,000-year coma in the realm of the Wizard of Life, there was an accident which caused his intravenous tubes to give him foreign chemicals. They were mixed with other chemicals so that it would not kill him. But these chemicals are what were responsible for his powers and superhuman strength. These chemicals, when combined with the electricity from the lightning conductor rods, caused him to burst into flames with a layer of fire 10,000 degrees hot, one foot thick, all around his body, shielding him. But instead of incinerating his skin instantly, it amplified and strengthened his powers 1,000-fold to make him practically invincible. All right. As this was happening, Marvin slowly woke up, confused and disoriented. Where am I? he asked, trying to figure out what was happening. That's not important. What is important is what we're doing, Frozen Heat answered. It's a callback. Yeah. And, and what's that? Marvin asked. Destroying King Arnold once and for all, Frozen Heat replied. This jogged Marvin's memory back to normal. Oh, Frozen Heat, why are you covered in fire? he asked, for he had never seen this before and was worried. Don't worry, it's all part of my plan. Now, do you feel well enough to fight? asked Frozen Heat. I guess so, Marvin replied. All right, then, let's go, Frozen Heat said. Just then, Frozen Heat's headset rang. Hello, said Frozen Heat, trying to lead Marvin behind the snipers into the back window of King Arnold's personal room. It was the Wizard of Life. I see you have found the potion. Good job. However, you have even bigger problems ahead of you. It appears that the stage one of the ultimate power has been activated. Is that correct? he asked. It's the only way, Frozen Heat replied, knowing exactly what the Wizard of Life was talking about. So your plan is to die killing King Arnold? The Wizard of Life asked. Yes, answered Frozen Heat. Look, I have to go now, okay? He said. Frozen Heat hung up, for they had reached the window of King Arnold's personal room. There, the four snipers were waiting for him. Get out of the way, or we'll kill you, Frozen Heat said. Oh, we're not afraid of you, one of the snipers replied, cockily. Oh yeah, Frozen Heat said. He then grabbed the sniper and held him against his fire shield, reducing him and his gun to ash. He then took the ashes and threw them off the roof. How about now, he asked, ready to do the same to the others. The remaining snipers tried to run away, but Marvin blocked their path. Where do you think you're going? He's not done with you yet, he said. Oh, please spare us, pleaded one of the snipers. We will, if you disarm the king's security system for it. Oh, okay. We will, if you disarm the king's security, si security system for us, Marvin replied. Uh, sure, we'll do anything. Just please don't kill us, they pleaded as they disarmed the system. They then ran free. Frozen Heat used his sword as a crowbar and pried the window open with it. Marvin then ran over to the corner and began randomly throwing out blood. He then came back to Frozen Heat. 
Uh, do you feel any better now after the heat? Well, I mean, you know, I could use a beer, but other than that, I'm fine, I guess, replied Marvin. Okay, I mean, that's, that's his dialogue. Well, there'll be plenty of time for, there'll be plenty of time for beer when we get you back home. Okay, let's go. We've got a king to assassinate, Frozen Heat said, excited to kill Arnold. They climbed through the window and quietly began to step inside. There, they spotted King Arnold sleeping in his bed. Okay, let's try to get this over with while he's sleeping, whispered Frozen Heat. They slowly approached King Arnold. As they did, Arnold's phone began to ring. Frozen Heat and Marvin hid underneath a nearby chair. Arnold woke up and answered the phone. He was one of the three remaining snipers. They were calling to warn the king of trespassers that they were unable to stop being on the loose and to watch out for them. Arnold jumped out of bed with intentions of setting a trap for the intruders. But on his way, as he passed by the chair that Frozen Heat and Marvin were hiding under, he smelled something burning. He, quiet, he quietly approached the, the already slightly burned chair and then suddenly picked it up and threw it, revealing Frozen Heat and Marvin. Arnold gasped as he had never seen someone on fire before. Also, he was shocked to see that the intruders got in while he was sleeping and made it past the security system, but he still wanted to act unafraid to intimidate the intruders. Ha ha! You thought you could fool me with your cheap hiding place, didn't you? He said in his evil-sounding voice. Well, let me tell you something. Nobody fools the great King Arnold Boxhedge, he added, trying to sound ominous. Boxhedge? Frozen, he said, puzzled and shocked. Yes, yeah, so that's my last name. What's it to you? Arnold said nastily. The son? Fr Frozen Heat asked. D -d I Father? Arnold asked, confused as he could not see Frozen Heat's face through the fire, but vaguely recognized his voice. What? said Marvin, even more confused as he did not even know that Frozen Heat had a son, and even if he did, Arnold? Alright, this is Act 3. Obviously it isn't structured this way, but you know... My last name is Boxhedge, too, Frozen Heat replied, and my first name is Comrise, but everyone calls me Frozen Heat, he added. You are my dad. I never thought I'd see you again. Where have you been? You missed the most important events of my life, and if my calendar is correct, you've been gone one thousand years, Arnold said, anticipating Frozen Heat's answer. With the Wizard of Life, Frozen Heat said. I heard a lot about you recently, and I have to say, I'm pretty disappointed. What happened, Frozen Heat said. Well, some time after Mom died, and you met the Wizard of Life, and you started becoming his right-hand man and dedicating more and more of your time to him, I started becoming my own man. Then, when you said you were going to be gone for an unknown amount of time, and that I couldn't come with you, I had to find another source of attention. Being that I was an only child, at seven years old, I had to fend for myself. I waited for you for weeks and weeks, and you never came home. So I eventually left home and lived on the streets, unable to protect myself, until I learned how to fight. I was then able to get whatever I wanted whenever I wanted it. By the time I was 14 years old, everyone knew me, and everyone, even the cops, were afraid of me. And then the disease came, Arnold explained. And you want to know a little secret, he added. Arnold leaned in and whispered into Frozen Heat's ear. I caused it, he said. That's right, I caused the deadly disease that sickened everyone. And you want to know how? Well, after you left, I got really into chemistry. And one day, one of my buddies accidentally drank one of my chemical concoctions and fell deathly ill. It eventually spread to the whole town, then the whole state, then the whole country, and then the world. To every single person, except me, because I isolated myself from the world in an underground tunnel that I created. Twenty years later, I was thirty-five years old, and for the first time since I built the tunnel, I came back up to the surface. Everyone was still sick. Nobody knew what it was, so nobody could come up with a cure for it. Seeking power and respect, I ran for president of my country, and even though I didn't have parents, siblings, relatives, a house, or any political experience, I still knew, I still knew that I would be elected. How, you may ask? Oh, how, you may ask? Well, I came up with an antidote and offered to give it to anyone who voted for me. And then, before I knew it, here I was. Uh, I took what you would call the white. I took what you would call the White House and remodeled it into the castle you see before you. I invented an immortality pill, which my snipers and I got a share of, and I stayed thirty-five years old ever since. However, the mutants stole it and used it for themselves. War then erupted and never ceased since. 
However, the immortality pill only prevents aging or death from natural causes. So, since you're the first one to disarm the security system, make it past my snipers, and avoid all the other obstacles on the way over here, I feel that you're, a, I feel that you're worthy of battling me and giving me some excitement. And it'll just be an added bonus that in addition to all of that, I'm also getting revenge on my father for never being there for me as a kid, he explained. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, but I, I can't, said Frozen Heat, baffled and speechless. What? Marvin exclaimed. I can't fight my own son, Frozen Heat said, starting to cry for the first time in his life. Have you forgotten the whole reason we're here? Marvin snapped. We've come all this way just for nothing then? No, no, we have to fight him. Oh, I'm so anxious to beat the living- Shut up, Frozen Heat interrupted coldly. Just shut up, okay? You never even had a son, so you don't know what it's like. And even if you did, you wouldn't fight, much less kill him, right? Because if you would, then you're sicker than I thought. So just shut your mouth. I need to be alone, Frozen Heat said. He stood up. I need to process all this, he said as he walked away. And don't follow me. Marvin sat there speechless. He didn't know how to react to everything. Arnold got an evil grin on his face as he followed Frozen Heat into the other room. So, you brought Marvin here, too, huh? Arnold said in the same evil voice as he walked toward Frozen Heat. You probably spent more time with him than me, too. Oh, well, I look forward to killing both of you. Unless, of course, you think you've got what it takes to kill me, Arnold taunted Frozen Heat. I said I don't want to fight you, Frozen Heat said. Oh, come on, it's all right. Besides, there's nobody I'd rather be killed by than the man who gave me life, Arnold said, waiting for Frozen Heat to fight him. Well, then you've got the wrong guy, Frozen Heat said. What's that supposed to mean, Arnold asked. Frozen Heat sighed. He hesitated to speak for a moment, and then said, I didn't give you life, Frozen Heat said. How is that so, Arnold asked, as his evil smile turned to a more puzzled look. Do you want to hear a secret, Frozen Heat said. You were adopted by your mother and I when you were one week old, Frozen Heat explained. Arnold frowned. What? asked Arnold, hurt deep inside, but trying not to show it. When were you going to tell me? Frozen Heat began to walk away. On his way out, he turned to Arnold and said, On the day you die. And Frozen Heat then left. He entered the room where Marvin was, leaving Arnold in the other room. <laughs> he sat down next to Marvin. Sorry, Frozen Heat said. No, Frozen Heat. I'm sorry, Marvin replied. It's just that killing him is the only way to fully assure that he will be stopped. I mean, just take a look at what he's done to my people and to the world, he said. Yeah, you're right. It has to be done, Frozen Heat said, slowly building up his confidence. Okay, here's the plan. I'll go first. On my signal, join me, Frozen Heat said. You got it, said Marvin, happy to see Frozen Heat back to his old self. Frozen Heat went back to the other room. So, have you finally built up the strength and hatred to fight me? Arnold asked. Actually, yes, Frozen Heat replied. Let's go outside. I was thinking the same thing myself, said Arnold. They went out onto the roof. Arnold pressed a button, and the roof turned into an obstacle course. That's better. We wouldn't want it to be too easy, now would we? Arnold said. Certainly not, Frozen Heat said. Frozen Heat gave the signal for Marvin to come. Marvin hid behind one of the obstacles where he would stay until he was needed. What's with the fire? Arnold asked. Come see for yourself, said Frozen Heat, as he used his newly gained super strength to grab Arnold and shove him against his fire shield. Frozen Heat held him there for a couple seconds. Nothing happened. Frozen Heat put him down. Ha ha, is that the best you could do? Fire won't work on me. I have a fireproof vest on, Arnold said. Well, then I guess it's time to go to stage two, Frozen Heat said. He used his super sucking powers to suck. <laughs> I can see the fan fiction already. <laughs> oh, man. Frozen Heat used his super sucking powers to suck up water from the canal below and pour it on himself. It put the fire out in an instant. However, it hardened on impact and gave Frozen Heat a thick, impenetrable ice shield. This also came with unique ice powers. However, Frozen Heat's body was undergoing massive trauma from the first stage of fire, and his power was very limited. But he had to be a man and fight through it. Before Arnold got the chance to react, Frozen Heat blasted him with his newly gained ice cannon. <laughs> this pasted Arnold against the castle wall and froze him on impact. Frozen Heat continued to shoot him until the wall broke, sending Arnold plummeting down into the lava pit below. Well, that was easier than I thought it would be, Frozen Heat said, letting his guard down. 
About a minute later, the floor began to shake. Frozen Heat looked up to see Arnold inside one of his big flying battle machines. He landed right in, the, right in front of Frozen Heat. Please don't tell me that's the best you can do, Arnold said. No, it's not, Frozen Heat said, getting impatient. Just then his headset rang. There was only one person it could be. It was the Wizard of Life saying, Don't do it. Don't even think about activating the third and final stage of the ultimate power. I have to. It's the only way, Frozen Heat replied. Your body won't be able to handle it. You'll die, the Wizard of Life warned. Frozen Heat hung up and threw the headset over the edge. Completely ignoring the Wizard of Life's orders, he grunted really, really hard, popping countless blood vessels until his face turned blue. Okay, interesting description. Finally, the fire shield came back out. It was still burning inside of him this whole time. The fire and ice became one. Oh, please, don't waste your time. You can't touch me in here, Arnold said. Frozen Heat sighed. He closed his eyes and said, For what it's worth, I always loved you, son. Goodbye. Just then, Frozen Heat used his last resort secret weapon, every one of his 100 powers combined. He knew he would die from using it, but it was worth it to save his home planet. Marvin stood back to avoid getting exploded. Frozen Heat released his power. After the smoke cleared up, Frozen Heat looked over at Arnold. He was definitely dead. Uh, his machine was destroyed, as well as the obstacle course. Frozen Heat was dying and could barely move. His body went back to normal. He called Marvin over. Marvin suggested they finish him off. Frozen Heat agreed. Frozen Heat put his sword underneath Arnold. Marvin laid Arnold down and began to punch him in the groin at all angles until his fists got sore. They then stood him up and threw him against the sword, cutting him in two. They then pulled the sword out, splitting his rib cage in half. Marvin then gave Frozen Heat his pocket knife and gun. Frozen Heat then put his pocket knife into Arnold's heart muscle, along with a couple bullets from the gun, while Marvin clawed his eyes with his brass knuckles until they fell out. They then sliced his head open with the sword and pulled his brain out, and they took turns eating it. Uh, that's, that's hardcore. They high-fived each other as they finished the last fight. They were about to leave when Marvin discovered a grenade in Arnold's pocket. He smiled as he stuck it to his now two-piece body and threw him off the roof and into the lava pit, the grenade exploding in midair. Now that's what I call teamwork, said Marvin. They smiled and laughed heartily. Suddenly, Frozen Heat felt his inside shutting down. He knew that he didn't have much time. He stuck dynamite around the perimeter of the castle, blowing it up and crushing Frozen Heat in the rubble, killing him instantly. He awoke, finally freed of his body and pain, in the realm of the Wizard of Life. The Wizard of Life and Kate were right there at the transporter beam waiting to greet Frozen Heat. <laughs> now for my favorite part. Kate rushed up to Frozen Heat and began to hug him. Frozen Heat, appalled and disgusted, threw her off of him. Get off me, you filthy thing, he said nastily. If you don't want her, I'll be glad to take her, the Wizard of Life said, jokingly. Frozen Heat made an ungodly face at him before punching him in an area of his body we shan't speak of. That's that's legitimately what it says. Nobody strikes me in the forbidden zone when gets away with it. Now time to die, the Wizard of Life said, with the most anger in his voice of any creature in the history of our universe. He began charging up his hands, preparing to electrocute Frozen Heat. Bring it, old man, I'm sick of your crap, said Frozen Heat, anxiously awaiting his own death. Please stop, you two. You should be ashamed of yourselves, Kate interrupted. They both stopped in their tracks and stared at her with the most primitive form of confusion eating away at their faces for a few seconds before they both hugged each other while beginning an uncontrollable laughing spell. Anyway, congratulations, the Wizard of Life exclaimed. Now, usually I would just keep you here forever, but I have something special planned for you. As a reward for always helping me, after one hundred years in the simulator room, you get to you, you can get to become immortalized and keep the balance of the universe in check full time by taking the place of the icy face. Exclaimed the Wizard of Life. I don't go anywhere without Marvin. Frozen Heat said firmly. Um, okay, fine. I'll give you thirty seconds in human form to get Marvin and bring him here. The Wizard of Life said. Frozen Heat woke up in human form and was right there by Marvin. He quickly took his sword to Marvin's neck, chopping his head clean off. He then took the sword to his own neck, instantly transporting them both 
back to the realm of the Wizard of Life. I brought Marvin, Frozen Heat exclaimed. Wonderful, he can take the place of the fiery face, the Wizard of Life said happily. The Wizard of Life then put them both in the robotic body in the chair. Suddenly, Marvin heard footsteps. A voice then announced, I am the Wizard of Life. Marvin watched as the Wizard of Life slowly freed him, but he still couldn't move. Well, what's going on? Oh, where am I? asked Marvin, worried and confused. Frozen Heat grinned. You've got a lot to learn, he said. The end. Oh boy, well, yeah, that's, that's pretty much exactly how I remember it. Um, well, uh, I hope you enjoyed. Um, that's a little look inside the creative mind of my 11-year-old self, I guess it is. See, I notice a lot of it, like, a lot of the stuff is just, like, side tangents. Like, there'd be, a, like, like two sentences that just, like, could be cut and you'd never know it. You know? Like, I don't know. I, I don't want to give, like, director's commentary on this right now. Let me know what you think in the, uh, in the comments section. Uh, obviously, you know, not, not, not my best work. It's not what I'm most proud of or anything like that. Um, you know, it's just fun looking back, you know, as a college student and all that on, like, you know, stuff that I made, uh, when I was young, I mean, I got 100% on the assignment, my instructor said it was the longest story that she'd ever read, uh, from the submission, she said, yeah, it's usually just, like, two pages <laughs> that a student does, but, um, but, yeah, so, obviously, she didn't read the whole thing, otherwise, there would have been a lot more, you know, a lot more questions and everything, um, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to call this video, but that's that's the story there. That's the bonus content. Um, so yeah, we'll see what else uh, I can I can find and um, and yeah. So uh, I I don't know. Have have a good night, everyone, and uh, you know, stay healthy and uh, stay uh, stay calm. All right. Uh, good night, everyone.